due to this public awareness talk on Chumki Bukhar, a serious health problem in India. Chumki Bukhar, or more commonly known as acute encephalitis syndrome, has claimed the lives of over 150 children in Bihar in the last month alone and continues to rage havoc with over 800 cases still being reported. While the symptoms, fever, mental confusion, disorientation, delirium, and the onset of seizures are, un are known, the cause of the disease is still unclear among the general public. And in order to raise awareness, we have with us our speaker for today, Dr. Avinash Deoshatwar. Dr. Avinash Deoshatwar is a scientist in the epidemiology group at ICMR NIV in Pune. He was a part of the influenza disease burden in India, IDBI, which was the first of its kind to study and assess rural disease burden in India. And he has also worked on cases of AES, acute encephalitis syndrome, in Gorakhpur for three years. He has been a part of various central government investigation research teams, which investigate outbreaks of diseases and epidemics across India. His areas of research include viral and infectious disease epidemiology. We request Sachin to welcome our speaker with a bouquet of flowers. Dr. Avinash to address the gathering. Thank you, Romeo, for the introduction. Uh, good evening, all my friends. And I, I was told that there would be some uh, school students also, but they haven't come, I think. Okay, fine. So actually, it's a great pleasure to be among these, among uh, you all guys, the brightest minds in India. Uh, I'm. I think uh, over the past one, one and a half months, you guys must have read a lot, of, lot about uh, this Chamki Bukhar in Muzaffarpur. Have you read about any other encephalitis syndrome or AES uh, cases or deaths in India before that? Or? No. Huh? Gorakhpur. Mein. When was it? Past 10 years. And what are the different modes that you come, come to know about, like uh, these outbreaks or maybe these kind of disasters, health disasters in India? What are the different modes for you to come to know about them? Social media. Social media. Okay, and? So you guys were curious about this thing because there were a lot of news, uh, I mean, in last one, one and a half months. Fine. So in 2002, uh, a team from New Delhi went to Saharanpur. There was a mystery disease that may be viral encephalitis. That's what the team said after the first initial visit. After uh, Dr. T. Jacob John from CMC Villor, he went there and uh, they did a research for maybe one, one and a half months. And they came up with the hypothesis that it was caused by uh, mushroom that was affecting the central nervous system. So it was not viral encephalitis as such, but Encephalopathy. This is Gorakhpur has a this is a news that was published in 2017. Gorakhpur has a history of children's deaths due to encephalitis. More than 25,000 children have died. Uh, I worked in uh, Gorakhpur. Uh, we have a unit there in BRD Medical College. Uh, in that medical college, the pediatrics department has experienced more than 150 deaths per bed over the last 40 years. So since 1978, we are having these uh, encephalitis outbreaks every year. So during uh, second week of July to end of uh, September, October, they are having this outbreak. More than 2,000 children experience this acute encephalitis syndrome, and around 20%, around 500 to 550, they die every year there. So every bed has experienced more than 150 deaths per year uh, in that hospital. So, so that's encephalitis in Gorakhpur. There was a huge outbreak of Chandipura virus in North Telangana. That paper was published by National Institute of Virology and IV scientists in 2007. In, again, in 2000, just before 2007, just before the publication of this paper, uh, there was an outbreak in Maharashtra also, in Nagpur division, but this was a smaller outbreak. What it shows is the National Vector Borne Disease Control Program, NVBDCP. So that's an umbrella institution that looks after the vector borne diseases in India. 
So if, wherever you go, if there are any mal malaria control programs or dengue control programs, programs for chikungunya and any other uh, vector borne diseases, this is the Amrila Institute. They have thousands of crores uh, of rupees of funding and they only control the testing, diagnosis and treatment of vector borne diseases as well as prevention, their measures. Uh, as for any government data, this data is limited by the number of people that have approached the government systems. And to tell you, uh, in rural areas, around 70% of the population, they go to private sector. And in urban areas, that, pop, uh, that uh, proportion is around uh, 90 to 95%. That varies. So only around 5% in urban areas and around 30% in rural areas, they, they are giving these kind of figures, 10,485 AES cases and 632 deaths in 2018 in India. And they are, they are coming from Bihar, Assam, Jharkhand, Uttar Pradesh, uh, many states, but most of them are contributed by Uttar Pradesh, Bihar, uh, actually uh, Assam is also contributing some, and Orissa. I, yeah, so Orissa is not there. It, it's not mentioned in that document, but yes, Orissa is contributing. So what's acute encephalitis syndrome, AES? That, there is a case definition. So whenever we work in public health, we are actually very much uh, concerned about the case definition as such. Because whenever you are trying to look at a po large population, in, in India we have one seventh of the global population, isn't it? And if you want to know how many of uh, Indians, they are getting swine flu every day, then you need to have some kind of case definition because you cannot go and test everybody. So to understand that proportion, you need to have a case definition that is specific and sensitive enough, both of them. So you have to have a balance. So for public health people, case definition is a very uh, important concept. We are always concerned about this case definition. And in this case, the acute encephalitis syndrome, this actually case definition is a case definition in conundrum. It's a, it's a problem that we are facing. AES case by case definition, it's a person of any age at any time of the year with acute onset of fever and change in mental status and or new onset of seizures. You have to exclude the simple febrile seizures. These are very technical terms. Febrile seizures are seizures when there is no cerebral pathology involved. The child or the person has very high grade fever. That's why he gets seizures. But those seizures, they stop within 15 minutes. So they don't prolong. And those are generalized seizures. They are uh, never local. They are simple uh, febrile seizures. So you have to exclude them before you can term a case AES. Acute encephalitis syndrome. The problem is when we say it is encephalitis, this is what we get. Encephalitis is encephalon and itis. I think bi the biology people here, they might know. What is itis? Itis is inflammation and encephalon, encephalon is the whole brain as such. What is inflammation? That is characterized by rubber. Rubber is redness, calor is temperature, dollar and functional laser. That's loss of function. If these four th things are there together, redness, temper uh, rise in temperature. Redness is because of increased uh, per uh, perfusion, blood perfusion in that area. So redness, tem temperature, pain, and loss of function. These are the four characteristics of inflammation. So anything that is inflamed, that will have all these things. And then if it is the, about the whole brain, you call it encephalitis. If it is about the gastric, uh, about the stomach, you call it gastritis. If it is about the colon, you call it colitis, and there are different uh, etiologies of any itis or inflammation. The problem is encephalitis is caused by either pathogens or toxins. What we see here is a different case. I'll show you. So National Institute of Virology, NIV, uh, our institute, we had a unit in Gorakhpur. Now that is uh, a full-fledged institute in itself, itself. It has now detached. But when I was there, it was a unit of this NIV. And in 2016, we tested the, all the 2,500 patients for these many agents. That's Japanese encephalitis virus, dengue, Orangea, Tsutsugamoshi. That's, uh, that's not a bacterium as such. Um, uh, that's a bacterium, it's not a virus. Other rickettsia, hepatitis A, E virus, measles, mumps, varicella zoster, rubella, rubella herpes, iftin bar virus, cytomegalo, parvovirus, and influenza B, 
influenza B virus and there is a hemophilus influenza bacterium. Nigeria is a bacterium, streptococcus is a bacterium. All these agents, they can cause encephalitis. Because we had more than 2,000 cases, we didn't know what exactly was causing the highest number of cases. If you look at the posi percent positivity, 56% they showed positive for Orencia. So that's a bacterium, that's a, uh, one of the rickettsia groups. So why I'm showing you all these etiologies for encephalitis? Because anything, any organism that can cross the blood-brain barrier, that can cause encephalitis. What is a blood-brain barrier? It is made of these uh, astrocytes, and these junctions, this is a cerebral blood vessel, the capillaries, the, the junctions between these endothelial cells, they are called tight junctions because the connecting proteins, they are abundant in number and they are very strong. So these junctions are very tight, they are impermeable, nothing can pass through these junctions very easily unless there, is, there are any macrophages that are supposed to migrate towards uh, the brain tissue from the circulation, then only there will be any gaps, the gaps will be, create, will be created by the system and then only the uh, macrophages will migrate into the blood, uh, I mean uh, brain tissue. These are uh, astrocytes, these are astrophytes, uh, these are pericytes that are actually between uh, these astrocytes and uh, the blood vessels. So the tight junctions, astrocytes and pericytes, the, these create a very tight kind of barrier for anything to pass from the uh, blood vessel to brain. So this is our natural uh, mechanism to protect the brain from any uh, organisms. So anything, any organism that can take advantage of any kind of breach in this blood-brain barrier that can cause encep uh, encephalitis. So that can be your in influenza virus, the influenza virus that causes sore throat and all, or any, any uh, respiratory virus also, that if that crosses the blood-brain barrier, that will cause encephalitis. So um, regarding this uh, Muzaffarpur uh, encephalitis, we are hearing it because of the media, isn't it? So. Uh, we have our lives going on every day. There are uh, many things that, that happen. And uh, for uh, in our lives, we are more uh, worried about what is written in our books or maybe what is our uh, syllabus and how I am going to crack the exams and maybe what is my project and wh what people are doing in those things. Once in a while when media, the new media that we are having now, I mean, uh, our democracy is maturing probably, our science is maturing slowly, so is the media and they are getting aware of all these things. Um, just, just like a knee-jerk reaction, they will come up with something that, that is sensational, and that's why it will grab our attention, isn't it? In Muzaffarpur, people are experiencing these kind of outbreaks since 1992. So that's more than 26, 27 years. In, and uh, these cases started coming to the Muzaffarpur Medical College, the Sri Krishna Medical College and Hospital, SKMCH, since 1992. They were happening around in, that, in those uh, districts, Gaya, Shivhar, uh, East Champaran, and Muzaffarpur. They were happening in those districts for quite some time before that, but they were not reported. So the consolidated reporting that started in 1992. In the initial three to four years, it was termed as encephalopathy. Just, I mean, try to look at how the wisdom changes over time. So in the initial three, four years, they were calling it encephalopathy, but due to, due to its temporal relation to lychee season, they started calling it lychee encephalopathy. So there was no evidence as such, but they started calling it lychee encephalopathy just because it was parallel to lychee uh, season. And later, it was termed as acute encephalitis syndrome. This acute encephalitis syndrome that has come from the WHO, so it is a WHO surveillance case definition. And the same case definition has been adopted by NBBDCP, the institute I mentioned earlier. Unfortunately, in India, all the hospitals, the pediatricians, they are all following this case definition blindly. So we just go by whatever CDC or WHO says. We are not concerned about what exactly is happening in front of our eyes or in our society. So, and whenever public health people, they start working in, on any uh, new problem, they are worried about this thing. So if they have any kind of comfort, okay, there is a WHO case definition and uh, we'll start working on, on it. So that's one of the unfortunate uh, aspects of our public health research in India, that people got 
stuck with this uh, acute encephalitis syndrome case definition, and that's how they started terming those cases in Muzaffarpur. And there were multiple theories of etiology that we'll discuss later. So th there were some common media reports during those times in 1990s and early 2000s that it is a mysterious disease, uh, it is acute encephalitis syndrome, some people would call it, call it encephalitis, some people would call it brain fever, and the population calls it chumkiki bimari. So any seizure that is called chumki uh, in that area, if any, uh, anybody from Bihar is here and they are aware of those colloquial languages, they will know. So they call it chumki. So even if there is a uh, seizure in one hand or the whole body is uh, having seizure, they, they will call it chumki and then it's chumki. So it's a very generic term. Uh, Dr. Uh, Gopal Sahani, who is the HOD of pediatrics, he has been working there for uh, quite, I, I think, around two decades or so. Uh, he has provided the, uh, this information to us this year. So in 1995, uh, there were more than 300 deaths. 2005, around 200, all the data is not collected there, I mean, uh, in per perfect shape. So uh, I will have to make do with these figures. 2010, there were around 30. 2011, 100 deaths. 2012, there were around 150 deaths. In 11 and 12, NIV teams went there. They collected samples uh, of the CSF. CSF people know here, right? So uh, the cerebrospinal fluid, that is the fluid that flows uh, inside the uh, central nervous system. So they collected those samples in 2011. I think they collected uh, brain biopsies also, liver biopsies, and tried to see if there was any evidence for any infection uh, in those samples. In 2013, there was a sort of lull. 2014, uh, 170 deaths recorded here. Ac the actual number was uh, much higher. Actually, I went there in 2014 also. We're, we were there for Three weeks. I'm sorry. Yeah, May, June, June. Here, June. It is June, May, June, April to June and June. Why is this? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, we'll address that later. So uh, I work in the epidemiology group. We are we are definitely going to come to that discussion in details. So uh, I work in the epidemiology group, and uh, all the epidemiologists, they are worried about these, uh, not worried, they are, they are uh, concerned about these two triads. So that's a distribution triad. In epidemiology, we are looking at the time, place, and person as a distribution triad, how it is distributed among time, place, and person. And then the causation triad would be the agent, host, and environment. Here, the time is known. The person is known, I mean, that's very obvious. The place is known. The agent, that actually is a question mark. Environment is a question mark and host. Is host a question mark here or you would think that it's easy to say that yes, they are, I mean, that would be easy to know. That would be easy to say who's the, who the host is. Yeah, see, um, uh, yeah, let, let me tell you. It is about causation, okay? So when you say it is a cause, so if something happens, if it is a cause, then the effect should be there, okay? So if you say, I know what are the host factors that are responsible for it, then you are definitely saying that, okay, the, if these factors are there, then I should see encephalitis or encephalopathy in that uh, person. So if you decipher the host to that level, uh, then definitely you will be able to prevent it. So, so uh, we'll go, we'll try to see, I mean, about all these six factors, the time, place, person, the agent, host, and environment. So this is where Muzaffarpur is, and these are the Himalayan ranges. This is Nepal. Uh, can, you, can anybody say what is special about this region? Geographically, geographically, Huh? Gondwana plate, anybody knows what is Gondwana plate? No? Go Gondwana plate, Gondwana plate, anybody know? No. 
Yeah, the tectonic plate of North India, it detests from? Uh, from? Africa. Yeah, from Africa. Africa, it, it lower part, uh, part of Africa, it uh, detached and then it gradually migrated and it got attached. Isn't it? Right, so, so the Himalayas, they were created because of, because this plate is just going, uh, going under, the, uh, under the Tibetan plate. So this region is at the juncture of this Gondwana plate and the, uh, the, the Tibetan plate, I, don't, I just forgot the name of that plate. Many of the areas in this region, they are 50 feet below sea level. And areas means it's, it's not like a small ditch or something. Hundreds of kilometers and maybe a width of one or two kilometers that below the sea level, 50 feet below the sea level. So it's like on one side you have Himalayas and on the other side you have these plains or plateaus that are, that, that are in the trees. That's why they, are, they call it Tarai Belt. Hey, no? people in the, the, that area, they might know. It's called a Tarai Bay. So it's a, uh, a depressed kind of uh, ecology. And it's a plain land. For kilometers and kilometers, you won't see a small mound also. It's very plain. So for kilometers, you will just see plains of uh, rice or wheat. And the, till the horizon, it's all green. So th this kind of land is there. And if you see, um, this is, this is uh, Muzaffarpur and Janakpur. That is three hours drive. Gorakhpur is five hours drive, maybe. So this is, this is the place in our triad. The population, according to 2011 census, there might be some changes in it, maybe around five to 10%. But the total population is 48 lakhs in the Muzaffarpur district. And in zero to six years population, most of the people who are affected in this uh, population, the males are around 4.4 lakhs and females 4.303. And the proportion of total population is 17.61%, the affected population. The male to female ratio is, uh, I, I, I got, yeah. That's, uh, the sex ratio is 1915 females per thousand males. Uh, most of the population is uh, poor. The family size is 5.2. So if you look at uh, the socioeconomic indicators, you will see wherever there is more poverty, the family size will be higher. Unless uh, you go to some places in Rajasthan, where there are large families who are well to do, but they, they, they are together, I mean, they are uh, what we call huh? joint families. So because of joint families, their family sizes are large. But uh, most of these are um, nuclear families with large family sizes uh, in rural, uh, rural areas of uh, Bihar. The summers are dry and hot, early summers. But in late summers, it's very hot and humid. The rainfall is heavy, winters are very cold, and the minimum temperatures, they go up to nine. Ecologically, I, as I explained, this is the kind of uh, scene you will see in most of the places all over these four or five uh, districts. And this is just to show I mean, the kind of houses they have. Yeah, we will go back to these uh, images later. This is just to show you the houses, the poverty, and the terrain as such. OK, so because it was uh, termed as a lychee encephalitis, we tried to see whether there was any correlation with uh, lychee plantation. So these are the different blocks of Muzaffarpur districts. In 2014, there were uh, 52 cases from Mushahiri, and population was around 3 lakh. And the area under lychee plantation, it is in hectares, not acres, that's hectares. We tried to see whether there is any um, direct correlation, but we didn't find. Probably if we have the data for last 30, 40 years, and the actual, the pure data as such, with similar case definition over four decades, then probably we'll be able to come up with some kind of correlation. But uh, this is a scanty data around uh, six, 700 cases that year, and that didn't give us any correlations. But I suspect there might be some correlation. So the precipitation is high in July. In June, it was uh, low. And if we look at the minimum and maximum temperatures and the averages, 
this is the period when the cases start, May third week or so. But actually, there the temperature starts going down. The temperature start going down. The uh, even the average temperature start going down, and the precipitation they are also low. If we, uh, if if there are any people who are working in earth sciences, they might be able to understand or decipher this data better than us actually, because here what here what we see is uh, during this period when the temperature difference comes down and the humidity difference, oh sorry, when the temperature difference is high, the humidity difference across the day on an average is high. That's the time when we see a lot of cases. So whether this fluctuation can cause any physiological effects, uh, we tried to look for some literature on it, but I mean, th there was nothing conclusive on it. So uh, the only thing we could see was whenever the differences across the day, the temperature difference, the mix maximum minimum, that was more, and the humidity also was fluctuating. But unfortunately, we didn't have any information on whether when there are high temperatures, the humidity is also high, or it's the, the other way around. So when the temperatures are low, the humidity is high. If, if, if we had that data, probably that will give us some kind of clue towards the physiological changes, but um, th there is nothing conclusive as such. Yeah, any, any questions so far? Like, you are still in the bus or you, are, you have lost the bus? So you have shown data for the mortality rate across different time periods. So do you uh, also consider the data where there might be susceptible cases, but not uh, affected? I mean, that some person is expected to have a disease based on symptom-based diagnostics. Okay, now, the way I understand your question is, I didn't show mortality rates. I showed the numbers of uh, children yeah, that you, died. Uh, you showed death, death uh, in different time periods. Right. right. So, uh, I mean, that do you also consider data where a person is expected to have uh, this disease based on symptoms? Nah, you mean, nah, you mean ki, uh, if, if there is a population and we see how many of them might, might actually ha get yeah, this disease? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, that's why I showed you uh, the population of those children. Nah? So all those children who are staying in that area, they are actually at risk of developing the disease because it's very specific to that region. Okay, I mean, confined to a particular belt, and once the person has uh, acquired this disease, uh -huh. uh, so I mean, a genetic model for the spread of the disease across that particular region, based upon the environmental conditions and others. Nah, no, I don't think, I mean, I am still not getting your question in, in the crystal clear manner. See, the thing is, uh, all the children in that age group, they are susceptible. Yes. Okay. So, we don't know the risk factors that put the children at risk of developing that disease. That risk, those risk factors have not been crystallized so far. So, we are trying to find them. There are many things that people have come down to, but, uh, but I am not sure whether you, you can really say, okay, these are the thousand children who might develop the disease. No. Because this is sort of correlation-based uh, model, but not a causative thing. Nah, you can't have, I mean, for, for uh, developing any kind of causation model in epidemiology or, or health, uh, you have to go by uh, Hill's criteria of causality. Are you aware of the? No, I'm not. Okay. So, okay. I, I think uh, at the end of this lecture, we can uh, have this question and answer. So now uh, we go to the, the patient as such. When the patients come, they are 98% of them, they are from the lower socioeconomic stratum. More than 95% of them are from rural areas or areas they are living close, in close proximity to uh, the lychee fields or mango plantations. 64% of them are between two to five years, 23% between five to 10 years. So actually, when I showed you below six uh, population, that was because 64% of the population, uh, the cases, uh, they are from uh, this age group, two to five. The male to female ratio among admitted cases is one is to 0 0.7, that's male to female, and among this, it is one is to 1.25. So uh, the admitted girls are dying more, or the, the Girls are dying more, isn't it? But 
it is not statistically significantly different, at least for that data. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have a system in India where you have specific uh, numbers uh, with good and crystal clear case definitions where you can put all these numbers together and probably you will have uh, these correlations uh, significant. Yes. Uh. Yes. Yes, yes. Lower socioeconomic uh, stratum. Uh, uh, I mean, yeah, right. The ballpark figure would be something around 80 percent, 75 to 80 percent. Yes. So, uh, if we look at the age of admission, uh, that is 2014 data and 2017. We don't have any control over any other data uh, in that hospital. So, 2014 we went there. 2017 I was there. No, now, uh, sorry, 17. This is 19. Sorry. So 19, uh, this year I went, and this is uh, 2019 data. Uh, that's a typo. So you, if we uh, look at these bars, they look very similar, isn't it? Two and three here, um, three uh, year olds are affected the most, and here it was four. So around two to five, two to six years, that makes the chunk of the uh, children that get admitted there. And um, the incidence for 2014 year, that was 2,000, 2.5 to 10 per 10,000 among zero to six year old population. So incidence, you understand the concept in incidence, like it's the number of new cases among the susceptible people. So what we have seen is uh, once the child has this episode, the encephalopathy episode in Muzaffarpur, the same child doesn't experience it again. So actually from that population, you have to deduct the people who already had this episode, but the numbers are so small, the total number is 4 lakh and the number of cases is 300 or 400, you can actually ignore them while calculating. So it's, uh, the incidence is 2.5 to 10 per 10,000. Uh, right. Um, I mean, there are uh, variable data about this. The, the department says around 50% children die. Uh, the hospital would say around 30% children die, and our experience shows it is around 25 to 30%. Yeah. So, yeah, the mortality is around 25 to 30. These are the, I mean, best uh, patients in best condition. That's I, that, uh, that's what I would say, because many of the children uh, on many of the beds you will see two or three children. And uh, yeah, I, I worked as a. Uh, casualty medical officer for a year and a half. And we used to uh, get these high speed accidents, uh, young guys, girls, or maybe uh, even older people with uh, who are involved in high speed accidents or any, any kind of accidents. And uh, I used to see at least one death per day of any age. And then it was my responsibility to announce that death uh, to their relatives. So whatever the condition, you just go and announce, you go back to your room and then crack jokes with your friends and have a cup of coffee. So that was life, every day. After seeing so many deaths, this uh, Gorakhpur episode and after that this Muzaffarpur episode, these were the two episodes where I actually felt shaken. I mean, there are two or three children dying, uh, lying on a bed. One child dies, their parents come, they pick the, pick the child, the mother is crying, the other two are just, I mean, just looking at the mother who has lost a child. They don't know whether they will pick their child alive from that bed or they will be uh, taking a dead body. So, uh, yeah, so the patient and uh, the environment as such, that is actually very, uh, you may say, stressful in a way, and the media and the politicians and the public at large as such, uh, they don't help. They actually create uh, more problems uh, to people who are working there. So usually patient, uh, patients come with a sudden onset of generalized tonic clonic seizures. What I experienced there, I mean, this is what uh, the clinicians there say, generalized tonic clonic seizures. But what I, I have seen is there are no tonic seizures. You know what is tonic and clonic seizures? No. Tonic is when the body tone, the muscle tone increases. So the whole body is tight. 
and the boy will be the child will be shaking the head and the whole body will be shaking with a complete tone uh, with a higher tone so the whole body is stiff so it's a tonic seizure clonic is like many, multiple parts are giving jerks so if you have seen a child or a person who is having that kind of feet you will fit a gaya bolte na kisi ko ya jhatka a gaya to there if he is like jerking the whole body the muscle tone doesn't increase but he is jerking the whole body so that's a clonic seizure and the tonic seizure is where the whole body is tonic what i have seen is there most of them have clonic seizures very rarely i have seen tonic seizure among uh, those children but this is what uh, the information is given out the, there is a rapid progression to unconsciousness the mean glucose blood levels uh, at the time of admission they are 25 mg percent and the median is 43 uh, we know what's our fasting glucose like yeah, if you sleep the whole night how much you, do you need to have like if if you have 125 mg percent huh around 100 yeah so if somebody has 120 what would you call diabetic or it's okay huh fasting. fasting yes in the morning 125 would be a diabetic nowadays i mean they change the, these definitions every 3 years 4 years according to whatever uh, the guidelines come from various organizations including the pharma companies so clonic and occasional seizures continued in many patients there is a rapid progression to death in many cases the case fatality rate is ratio is around 0.3 so 30% of the children die as per government records okay so most of the patients reported no significant illness in the past or recent past other blood investigations like wbc counts they are mostly normal hemoglobin is at par with uh, the population levels serum electrolytes they are not deranged too much sgpt sgot and uh, alkaline phosphatase these three are indicators of uh, your liver function so sgpt and sgot uh, sgot they are slightly raised the ratio is also slightly raised that shows that these children have been under hepatic stress for over a period and uh, this year we saw around 25 to 30% of the children had hepatomegaly a large liver yes previous slide you mean okay hmm yeah why do you see a person who is having seizures does it help yes yeah 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 see uh, what is a seizure how does it occur what's what's your idea how how does a seizure occur how does a seizure occur i am trying trying to ask you i think i don't know that i that you don't know how does a muscle work contracts and extends yes so it contracts how does it contract why does it contract actin and myosin the, uh, the, that's a walk along theory isn't it so the, the, those threads come together why do they come together i mean when do they come together when do they start walking brain sends them. Brain, brain, brain them on orders what is it called motor cortex isn't it the motor cortex will start sending orders the motor cortex uh, if if there is uh, and how does the motor cortex work the electrical functions the, the, these are all electrical functions isn't it so if they start sending stimulus electrical stimuli it will start, the uh, the muscle will start contracting in a uh, violent manner isn't it so if you if you sedate if you calm the brain down then the chances of these uh, seizures they will go down that is one thing yes what i am trying to understand is does it do fundamentally to the patient does it help him or her like okay you no nah, see uh, ma- ma- having this kind of irritable brain activity is always harmful to the patient because it is not just the voluntary muscles that are affected your diaphragm may be affected if they, you have any uh, um, i mean uh, twitching in other uh, muscles where you don't want it then gradually and you you don't know where it will stop so you have to calm it down so that's a standard so you are trying to see whether this treatment is standard or not or if the treatment is trying to kill it no i mean uh, pediatricians from aims and aims patna kolkata they have been visiting and they are trying to uh, standardize all these protocols 
So this is this is the standard trend. Okay. So the MRI scans of the patients they revealed generalized edema of cerebrum and there were no focal changes. Why I am trying to show all these things? Because when we say it is encephalitis, when we say that the blood-brain barrier has been breached, some organism has crossed the blood-brain barrier and uh, entered the central nervous system. If that organism finds any host cells there, it will start multiplying, and it will have these um, focal changes when you take an MRI. In this case, we didn't have any focal changes there. The electroencephalogram, like we have electrocardiogram, ECG, we have electroencephalogram uh, that shows you the electrical activity of the brain. And the, this is a secondary inf information from Nimhans. Uh, there is a, a mental health in, uh, and neurology institute in Bangalore. So this Nimhans, uh, they said that it was more suggest suggestive of encephalopathy than encephalitis. And around 10% of the patients, they reported hyperactivity, aggressive behavior, loss of partial power in an extremity as a sequelae. So you know what is sequelae? Sequelae is after the patient recovers completely from the acute illness. And over the period of long time, they, fee they have this residual kind of uh, problems or res residual limitations uh, to their function. So that's called sequelae. So around 10% of them have it. Uh, when it comes to Japanese encephalitis, the encephalitis causing virus, uh, this, uh, the percent of children that have sequelae is around 25%. So that's quite large. Here, only 10% children get it. So when we say encephalitis, uh, usually we have a one to three days of prodromal phase. Because whenever any organism enters your body, and actually it manages to cross the blood-brain barrier, uh, the immune system will wake up and it will start giving the immune reaction. So this, uh, this uh, phase is called prodromal phase, when the body is trying to build up to defend against that organism. So in, during this pro prodromal phase, the body will uh, make some antibodies to try and capture those or inactivate, neutralize those viruses or bacteria the proteins will go and attach to those uh, bacteria or organisms and then our cells will be able to identify them and engulf them. So during this pro prodromal phase, uh, you uh, experience fever or malaise, uh, loss of appetite, you feel that your body is aching, you might feel headache, uh, and there is generalized uneasiness, weakness. So that's the prodromal phase. So that might be around one to three days, or that actually might be longer. In this outbreak, or during this Muzaffarpur episode, there is no prodromal phase at all. The children, they are happy playing around, going around, and uh, doing their daily routines till six or seven or eight in the evening. They, uh, most of the time, they take their uh, evening meals, and early in the morning, around three to four o'clock, uh, they wake up irritated, and uh, they start crying or shouting. And most of them have seizure either after they wake up and they start crying or shouting or uh, at the time of waking up, like they wake up with a seizure only. Within two to three hours or up to four hours, they reach that medical college and maybe in next eight to 10 hours, many of them are dead. So there is no prodromal phase as such. This, and this illness presents with convulsion directly fo followed by neurological and uh, science and death. So in encephalitis, you will have a prodromal phase for one to three days, up to five days, up to seven days. The child will have fever and many other symptoms, loss of appetite. Uh, the child will be irritable and there will be many other signs and symptoms. And then the, the child will have uh, show symptoms of affection of brain. So the brain gets affected and then the, the child will have either focal seizures or generalized seizures. In this case, you don't have any of these. And the frequency of generalized seizure is around 100%. Uh, if you talk about encephalitis, it is 30 to 50%. So what happening is what is happening in is Muzaffarpur. That's not uh, encephalitis as such, but encephalopathy. So there are uh, other uh, differences. I, I don't know whether you are interested in going in details of how encephalopathy and encephalitis they, are, they present differently, but. Uh, the progression to deep coma is slow. Here it is very fast. 
the mortality rates are around 20 to 50 percent. Here, the pediatricians say it is 50 percent. We don't believe them. It's around 25 to 30. Um, and the duration, the total duration of uh, the illness is around hours to days. Here, it is days to weeks. In uh, 2011, as I told you, uh, we, we took biopsies of brain and uh, liver, uh, and we found that there was no evidence of any kind of infection. So all the infectious etiologies, they were ruled out. Any of you who are working in molecular biology, they might know what is NGS, next gen sequencing. I don't know much, much about it, but yes, our scientists in the NIV, they did that. And they came up with a conclusion that no infectious agent was involved. And one more thing that we, you find in uh, encephalitis is CSF pleocytosis. Pleo is more cytosis is cells. So it's like you find more number of uh, WBCs in CSF when it is encephalitis. In encephalopathy, there is no pleocytosis. So in, uh, in Muzaffarpur patients, you don't find any cells uh, in the CSF. So where did this uh, lychee? Yeah, absolutely. And so, considering the case that it is coming through ingestion, uh -huh. it is because other things look, uh, fatty is not going to take some time to develop. Because you are, whatever the causing agent is, needs some time to breach the brain and then it starts providing and you see focal addition. Yeah. So, considering that it is because of some metabolite, uh, and I, I don't think it has been even looked for because all NGS data is only looked for if you have some sort of living. Of course, yeah, yeah. See, uh, I have to mention one limitation here. I come from National Institute of Virology. So even if there is any bacterial agent involved, NIV would be out of picture. No, no, I'm seeing the NGS data which was there. Yes. The thesis paper more or less vectors, right? Yeah. Which should be as a bacterial virus. But it is not taking into consideration if any metabolite coming through uh, Nishi is really taking up. And if considering the case Mm -hmm. It is very acute shock. Do we see inflammation in the other tissues? Or it hasn't been looked at? No, no, I, no there, there is no evidence of any uh, inflammation in, in the other tissues. Top. So that paper was published in Lancet. That paper talked, of, uh, talked about uh, the same theory. Uh, the neuroepidemiologist, uh, Dr. James Chesuar, who is like uh, renowned all over the world for neurology and epidemiology. Uh, he, wa he was there for two months. The whole team, around 14, 16 doctors, uh, they were in the hospital as well as the field. They collected samples from the patients, their siblings, and uh, they tried to uh, dissect them for many, uh, uh, many causative agents, so to say. Uh, but they didn't, and they came up with this theory. The origin of uh, Litchi theory that was in, uh, was this paper. It was published in 1974, and a professor from uh, University of West, West Indies in Kingston, uh, he published, and there they mentioned about this Jamaican vomiting sickness. It has started since 1951. They, here they say malnourished individuals and children appear to be the most susceptible victims. The fatalities are still occasionally reported through. Uh, though imp improved uh, educational and nutritional standards, uh, the incidence has declined after 1951. But it is about the Jamaican vomiting sickness. It is caused by ackee fruit. Ackee fruit is uh, from the same family as lychee fruit. And they have large fields of ackee fruit in Jamaica. Just like uh, they have lychee uh, plantations in uh, Muzaffarpur. So this was the origin of that thought that actually lychee might be involved uh, in this uh, issue. So if you, we look at the comparison of lychee and ackee fruit, uh, hypoglycemia causing agent, <coughs> the MCPG, methyl cyclopropylene glycine, 
that is uh, present in both these fruits because they are from the same family and it reduces the glucose, increases lactate, the fatty acid increase, increases due to lychee fruit. But what we have seen is um, the fatty acid levels, they were not very high or they were not raised. Unfortunately, we don't have the baseline data. What's the baseline for the population? We didn't have it, but it didn't look uh, raised as such. And there is a hypoketonemia. So, <clears throat> uh, whenever uh, the body is deprived of uh, glucose, uh, the brain has to survive on glucose. The, so the first resource for the body to get glucose is the glycogen storages in the liver. So the glycogen starts breaking down and you, uh, the blood will get ready glucose for the brain to use. <clears throat> what happens in uh, malnourished children, the glycogen storages are, they are depleted, they are almost absent. Then the body goes to the next level where it is trying to oxidize the fatty acids into ketone. The ketone also can be used by brain. Their theory was that lychee fruit that and the, uh, especially the MCPG that interferes with the oxidation of fatty acids into ketones. So the ketones, ketone levels were uh, low in this, but actually in ackee fruit, the ketone levels were high. The only difference in uh, clinical presentation we see in Jamaican vomiting sickness and uh, the cases in Muzaffarpur is there people have uh, severe uh, stomach pain and they have vomiting there. In, uh, in children in Muzaffarpur, we don't see any vomiting at, at all. But whether hypoketonemia is uh, related to them, uh, that, that's questionable because there is no mechanism that will relate uh, ketone levels to uh, vomiting. So this is the cycle. Uh, I'm not a biochemist, neither I'm a molecular biologist, so I don't understand much of this. What I understand is the MCPG that interferes his uh, uh, reaction of getting uh, oxidation of fatty acids into ketone. And it's, it uh, blocks it at two or three different sites inhibition of beta oxidation and the metabolite that remains that is actually toxic to brain. That's the theory. Uh, I mean, I neither I do understand too much about it and nor do I confirm with it because that cannot happen over the period of two, two hours. It will take a long time. And for this MCPG to grow to these levels where it can actually cause encephalopathy, you need to eat at least five kilograms of lychee. And I don't see children eating five kilograms of lychee in a day or two or maybe a week. So uh, Dr. Gopal Sahani, who has been working there for around two decades, uh, he is now the HOD. Uh, he has this heat encephalopathy theory. So either it is heat exhaustion or heat stroke. The humidex value that remains in uh, danger zone, humidex value, you are aware what is humidex value? Nope. Hu okay. We'll go to the next slide. We'll, no. Okay. So this is the humidex value and these are the comfort zones. So if the temperatures are around 22 to around 30 and the humidity levels are below 80, that's the most comfortable zone for human beings. Actually, we are from this tropical region. So I think this humidex value that was calculated for people in Canada. So our humidex values will be slightly higher than their values probably because we are used to higher temperatures all the time. So even if we consider children in this region where the temperatures are more than 38, uh, 38, 39, instead of we starting at 35, if we start at 37, the humidity levels definitely they will make you uncomfortable. So this humid discomfort values they will uh, in uh, in this region that will stay actually because the te uh, the temperatures are more than 37 and the humidity levels are 70 to 75 percent usually all over the day. I, I think if somebody noticed during those previous slides, uh, <clears throat> the humidity levels don't fall below 50 percent. So it's the same information that I showed in the previous slide it's trying to correlate the average humidity, average temperatures, and uh, the number of cases. What I, the issue with these kind of correlations is, 
actually we don't know what are the variations across the day and how our body or physiology reacts to those temperatures in different times of the day so if you have high temperatures and high humidity at around 11 you know 11 o'clock in the morning your body might start reacting differently when it's around 9 or 10 10 o'clock in the night you want to sleep the body ha has gone into a different mode the liver starts getting more blood flow than the brain itself muscles start getting less blood flow and <clears throat> skin actually it's like bare minimum and at that uh, time if the temperatures and the humidity levels they are high the body's reaction might be completely different from what it is at around 10 or 11 in the morning or 2 o'clock in the afternoon so we don't have those kind of variations uh, according to time uh, in these uh, average humidity and average temperatures so i think talking physiologically uh, that doesn't make too much of a sense but yes we might get some kind of indicative uh, information from the uh, these bars but here uh, we try to analyze it and it doesn't give anything okay so we are now at the end of it uh, these are different hypotheses and the points for and against them we can like talk about them one one by one uh, before that i think i'll just take questions and then we'll just finish off with the comparison as such right so like the, that's the uh, metabolite of uh, incomplete the cycle yeah. yeah so that's what I said i uh, don't conform to that theory just because the quantity of lychee you need to eat for those toxins to grow to that level would be around 5 kgs of per day or so, so that hasn't been tested in the blood uh, i don't think the, i mean yes ammonia levels have been tested they are slightly raised but not to toxic levels and this year they have taken more samples so we might have some results on the ammonia lines probably in general also does hypoglycemia give symptoms of encephalopathy in hypoglycemia will definitely cause encephalopathy but the hypoglycemia is gradual and all these children they are two three or four year old children it's not like an infant who just cries when it is hungry <clears throat> so if a four year ch old child or five year old child uh, starts getting hypoglycemic uh, he will start complaining isn't it then uh, there are different uh, stages of hypo hypoglycemia if uh, when it starts uh, you get irritable so you actually had those uh, ads isn't it somebody starts getting irritated and wo chocolate deta khane ke liye so you start eating a chocolate so you get irritated first then uh, then the child becomes more fuzzy then it will be uh, cold and clammy um, skin so the person will be cold but it will he will be sweating so cold and clammy skin and then and if, if the child is inside the home if, uh, the child knows that he will get food if he cries or if he asks for it then there is no reason for the child not to ask for food so uh, i suspect the hypoglycemia has to be very fast so if, if it is gradual and especially when somebody is sleeping somebody if somebody is playing in the sun and they are already hypoglycemic for one one and a half hours they start they keep keep on playing then definitely their glucose levels will go down very fast but when the child is sleeping i don't see any reason for the levels to drop so fast that the child will wake up unconscious or directly get a seizure and not ask for food so which one the leachy hypothesis ah the leachy hypothesis it was just termed leachy just because it was happening in the same leachy season so there was no scientific reason so for I mean, that has anybody tried to experiment with this in a modern organism to figure out what is leachy you mean uh, experiments in mice or monkeys or so nah, no, not yet see uh, what uh, i mean the theory that's going around nowadays is uh, these are children from uh, lower socio economic strata 
and these children, uh, I mean, the parents, they are not very attentive to their children. So whether they have had food or not, they are not bothered too much. What the government says is we are giving food to them uh, uh, from the midday meal scheme and different meal, uh, school uh, schemes in the school. So they are not, I mean, the government is not willing to accept that these, these children are particularly malnourished. Um, physiologically speaking, I don't see there is there any reason that a five-year-old child's brain should react differently to hypoglycemia than somebody who is 15 year old. Physiologically, there, there shouldn't be any change. Yeah. Right. They're, they're very specific, exactly. So, uh, see, uh, if you want, uh, if you talk about the heat theory or heat exhaustion, uh, heat, uh, exhaustion um, there are places in Rajasthan that have experienced, like Churu, that had 50 degrees. None of the children died of, uh, I mean, very f maybe a few children died there of heat stroke, isn't it? Uh, poverty is there in uh, Gorakhpur region, uh, West Bengal, many parts of Maharashtra. It's there, but we don't see this kind of presentation there. So whether it is heat, whether it is humidity, yeah, there are m many more hot and humid places. Even Mumbai is there. So there is no dearth of malnourished children in Mumbai where hot and humid, you will see hot and humid uh, period for maybe a week or so. <clears throat> so uh, all these theories, if you try to look at them from this epidemi epidemiological angles, time, place, and person, if you try to compare them, they don't fit. Yeah, so there, there is no explanation as such. The only thing I could uh, see, but, but that's uh, a very cursory observation, is whenever there is less rainfall in June, uh, the number of deaths are more. So that, I mean, it's actually counterintuitive. Because if you say the humidity levels are high, then it should rain more. <clears throat> but it's not, I mean, it doesn't happen. So whether it is like uh, the humidity levels are high, but it's not precipitating. Uh, but, I mean, there are no correlation or there is no uh, physiological, pathological thread as such that will actually take, take your logical conclusion on this, based on these observations. These are very observational findings, don't mean much. Encephalopathy. No. Oh, no, no, no. I, th I think I did a very bad job in explaining what it is. I, I, I'm sorry. See, in the encephalitis, the brain itself is affected by the organism. So it will start multiplying. So it will start affecting more and more. Huh? I'm sorry? What is, what is multiplying bacteria? Bacteria, it could be virus, it could be protozoa, it could be uh, ma malarial parasite. Uh, falciparum malaria, you heard of? Nah, you don't see any hypoglycemia in those patients. And in the other case, you have hypoglycemia. Which other case? In this case, in, 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 this, in, this, in this particular case, you have hypoglycemia. The levels are 25 milligram per 100 ml of blood. And 25 is dangerous. It's I mean, if the blood glucose levels start going below 60 or below 70, you will st start feeling irritated. I mean, you won't... No, no, I didn't get to See, even if the liver, see, uh, if there is chronic malnutrition, what happens is uh, whenever there is excess glucose, the body will try to store it in uh, liver uh, in the form of glycogen. And there is a limit to it. There is a physical limit up to which it will store as gly glycogen. When the blood glucose levels, they are sustained above that level for a certain uh, longer period of time, it will start converting it into cholesterol, fat. And then it will start storing it, uh, and <clears throat> the places where it stores, they are also uh, fixed. So first it will start growing, going to your stomach, then... So if you like leave the children, so, this thing might Yes, that, that, I mean, that, that's the, that's, that's, that is the theory. See, the issue is, some of the children, uh, when they come to hospital, they have very low glucose levels. 
after uh, admission they get this 10% uh, glucose or some of them get 50% glucose bolus uh, the glucose levels go high and after 3 to 4 hours again the glucose levels they come down, Why they come down? yes so it's like some of the people they are saying th there is a pull mechanism the tissues are demanding more oxygen uh, glucose <coughs> one theory is it's the push mechanism there is certain toxin or something that is pushing glucose out of circulation so then is uh, none of these theories have been like proven yeah no 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 uh-huh see uh, there are two ways for the glucose to uh, go I, the uh, important and main uh, way is the cells they internalize glucose and they use it for energy production okay that's that's the second thing is that is degraded by some toxin or something glucose starts getting degraded i mean i no, no, I, I, I don't want to commit on it because i, I see the thing is, if you say that, yes, I have understood, next time you try to treat the patient with uh, those drugs or those mechanisms and the patient should survive, isn't it? So, <laughs> so you can't go uh, biased. See, I think it's difficult to prove. Yeah. Yeah, last year, uh, um, after 2014, and that paper was published in, I think, 16 or something. So in 17 and 18, there was this huge campaign about nutrition and all, uh, that you feed your children uh, during night times, uh, dinner is uh, compulsory, and there were some provisions made to uh, give out those meals uh, to children uh, during nights, and it had come down. So whether uh, and this year they were saying there were elections and none of these things were done, the machinery was lack and, and these are all political kind of uh, blame games. So, it, I mean, how much truth to uh, it is there, we don't know. I mean. And what about the reduction in the ingestion of lychee? Uh, the reduction in consumption of lychee, this year it has caused uh, mm, uh, a loss of 100 crore rupees to the plant, plantation owners. So many, many people have stopped. And in 2014, when I went there, after coming back, I was afraid of giving it to my son the first time. And then I was like, this is too much, isn't it? So. Yeah, you mean blood glucose after, uh, yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, see, it's like uh, you have to uh, keep on giving uh, glucose and there are certain intervals that uh, you collect blood for uh, blood glucose levels. I'm so, yeah, that's what I told. That's, uh, in many of the patients, the glucose levels, they go up and they remain uh, in a plateau at an acceptable level. In many patients, uh, they come down again. Ketone bodies, they are not formed. I'm sorry? Me? <laughs> no, no. Do, don't ask me to commit, no, not now. Yeah, and if we really come up to something, then probably to, you will read it in some publication, not on this platform. So, I mean, uh, I don't think we have to go through all these hypotheses, right? So, uh, just because uh, this is 2019, uh, July 3rd, just because there was such an outcry of uh, the plantation owners, this is the person who uh, linked lychee based on that 1974 paper to uh, this uh, Muzaffarpur encephalopathy. And Dr. T. Jacob John from CMC Bellor, he initiated that lychee theory. And ultimately, he had to come up with something like don't blame lychee because deaths in Muzaffarpur are due to chronic malnutrition. And lychee just adds the last straw on the camel's back. That's what he, that, that's his theory now. So this is a mother, ma, who says, ki maine apne bacche ka show paaya, and then around 10 p.m. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. I, say, uh, I think I mentioned it in uh, there. Uh, see, it, it must have been happening um, since long. The only thing is you record it or you come to know about it. So uh, from 1992, uh, they have started recording cases in Muzaffarpur Hospital. So once they start recording, once they start talking about it, then people come to know, okay, uh, if you have a patient of this kind of disease, then you pro probably should go to that medical college. So all of them start coming there, and then you have a uh, consolidated data there. Yeah, it, you, you never know. How, how would you know? I mean, uh, see, the, uh, um, uh, I mean, I, uh, I, I don't know whether you got this from the distribution. <coughs> the total population of under five children is eight lakh. Isn't it? 4.4 something males and 4.3 female. So 8 lakh ch children in Muzaffarpur district alone. And there must be around equal number of ch children of this age group in the neighboring districts. So we are talking about something around 30, 40 lakh of uh, children. Isn't it? Let's say 20 lakh children. So uh, among those 20 lakh children, you are getting these 300, 400 cases. So if you talk to somebody who is around 70 year old, and if you ask them ki chamki bukhar ka is gaon mein kab hua tha to they say ki ya ha 10 15 saal pehle ek ko hua tha ek ladke ko wo aisa aaya tha wo gaya so if you just distribute it on th those four or five districts uh, you will see them uh, spotted very rarely few and far between so i mean uh, that kind of wisdom that does, that is not coming through otherwise it's easy for us to uh, interview those children I, I i think i showed you one of those um, uh, pictures where we visited uh, the household of a uh, child who had died and his grandmother was there so we tried to ask her whether something like this has happened in the family or if she knows in her childhood if, if something had happened she couldn't give any information there You still look like a student, sir, so I didn't recognize you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. It was a pleasure. It was a very small token of our appreciation. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.